everyone and welcome back to The Grim Chronicles. My name is Kathy Grimm, the channel is The Grim Reader, and this is episode 25, pretty sure about that, of my weekly reading update. So I have a DNF to report. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. I give it, I gave it my best, partly because I was on the plane and this is the easy book that, and it, it was actually good for the plane, but I just was not enjoying this book at all. I don't think it's, I did not connect to the this, this style, the tone, and I, I mainly didn't connect to the Thomas Mann that is portrayed in here, um, mainly because I just think it's just too reductive and, and it's as if, how can you make one of the most exciting, interesting families seem kind of mundane or boring almost? <laughs> He did it. Um, I mean, not exactly. They're still pretty interesting in the work, but what I love about Thomas Mann, so his brilliant use of the German language, his um, kind of the way he, the lens through which he views the world, none of that was came through in the book to me. Um, I guess in a certain sense, one of the main things that's missing is Thomas Mann, the writer. This is Thomas Mann, the family man, and also Thomas Mann, the repressed or not sort of secretly in terms of act, acting homosexual, but actually not so secret because of his works, you know, it's quite, it's quite open. Some, I mean, he, he kind of, he didn't really hide it that much in his works, his proclivities. So, I did kind of look around for other people's, I know this is a beloved book by many booktubers and other people. So I was looking around for, well, does anyone agree with me that it wasn't that good? <laughs> I did find a few people. <laughs> uh, the first person I found a pretty scathing review in the Times Literary Supplement by Michael Hoffmann, who's a German living in England, whose father was a German novelist, Gerd Hoffmann, sounds kind of interesting. And he describes it as a bio nov, so a biopic. Um, at the level of a biopic. So my discussion of is this middle brow kind of like but leaning towards you know not not good middle brow and um, he's pretty disdainful of the whole project. He sort of describes it as a a bigger version of the, ma the master which is Tobin's book on James. Likely emboldened by the master's reception Tobin has bigged up everything the magician, three syllables, not two, an extra hundred pages and covering not five years, but 60, etc., uh, etc. Et so what seems to offend uh, uh, Hoffman is the fact that it's very much, it's too pedestrian. And, and I kind of agree, it, it just kind of, boom, we have the Buddenbrooks and that's described there. And boom, it's the next work. Boom, they go to, to Italy and he writes uh, um, Death in Venice. It's very sort of, the works themselves just get very short shrift and then you get this sort of, they're connected through this, the family stuff, I guess. And also just the, the different, I mean, quite a bit of room is given to their moving around in Switzerland after they'd had, and also his having to deal with the Nazis and come out as, you know, uh, someone who's strongly against what they're saying, what they're doing. I mean, in his, in his innermost being, he was, deeply offended by the Nazis, of course, but it was more almost at the level of a kind of an aesthetic disdain or disgust as, as opposed to a political, but then, it, you know, he kind of comes around and his kids help him there a little bit. Um, he does kind of give, that takes up some part of the, the book, the Tobin's book. Um, and so, yeah, I just didn't care for it. And then um, this guy, Hoffman, hustling through, in all this soap opera, which he calls it, tedious and poorly told, and lacking insight and accuracy to them as no, breathless and arbitrary and inconsequential to others, it is hard even to see Thomas, harder still to guess what he might represent to Tobin. So for that, I would say, uh, tedious and poorly told, it's just, it's, the style is very pedestrian and sort of, there's, it's sort of like a no style. So I could sort of see how that might work in a, in a regular novel, but for a, a biography of someone who's such a stylist, Thomas Mann, it doesn't quite work. So I could sort of see where he's coming from. In terms of the accuracy, I mean, from my gut feeling and a little bit of bio stuff I know about 
man, it didn't always ring true. Specifically, I mean, when we're getting into the technicalities of his homosexuality, which is, you know, everyone knows he was by now, and then his his diaries have had, had been published, except this stuff that he did do away with, I guess. And there I have to say, kind of, the little bit I know about the uh, Danish Hans Christian Andersen, the fairy tailist, who also, you know, his diaries were very kind of embarrassing because they talk about what diaries talk about, you know, um, masturbation, etc., etc. Um, so same with Thomas Mann's diaries. So ooh, embarrassing, and also his his um, homosexuality and his his leadings, his his desires, which. Um, it always makes you feel a little bit like a voyeur or kind of like you, you shouldn't really be reading this, but we are reading it. So, um, you know, makes me a little bit uncomfortable. And so, and Tobin has really kind of gone all the way with the homosexual stuff and sort of he, a lot of the book is him desiring men or being desired and on, and also kind of acting out on it. There's a long passage where he sort of this young man comes into the family and they all kind of like him and Thomas really likes him and he kind of insinuates that they had an actual affair and I don't know about that. Um, some people seem to think, I mean it does depend on your stance a little bit so the you know people brushing hushing it all up but I mean there does seem to be a bit of a question as to how much of a practicing homosexual he was, not to get too technical here but <laughs> he definitely was interested in men, probably, I mean, probably more interested in men than, than women, although I mean, he had a pretty successful marriage with Katya, who of course knew what was going on, I'm sure. Um, anyway, so soap opera. Um, I did kind of, I was sort of thinking the whole time, why would a writer go off and write books about Henry James and Thomas Mann, two of the most sort of famously difficult and stylistically complex and sort of, you know, highbrow writers. Why would you do that? Is it, is it hubris? Is it, I don't know why. And so I think, I think in a way, I guess I'm asking the same question that Hoffman is asking. Why would you go do that as opposed to go write your own stuff and be, be like them as opposed to write about them? Is he writing about them because he can't be like them? I don't know. Another, perhaps uh, even more uh, interesting or sort of better in a way or less scathing article I found was by DT, DT Max in the New Yorker, I'll post a link. And um, he, he, his is more sort of almost positive. It's called, what's it called? The article is quite long. How Colm Tobin borrowed inside Thomas Mann's head. Um, to which I would say, well, how well did he do that? I don't know. But then if you go, and I sort of have a highlighted German here, uh, Tobin, it says here, he read no German and knew a little about Germany. And that's another thing where I'm going to put my Germanist hat on. How, I mean, that is that just hubris or what is going on there when you, you know, like, I hate to say it, but I do think something's missing there, specifically because Thomas Mann is such a stylist. His German, his his German is just phenomenally interesting, and to not have any interest in the language, let alone you know, I just don't quite. And, and even the country, the history, the complicated history of Germany. Um, I don't know. What, it's like, would I go off and want to write a novel about Tolstoy or? I mean, and then and then I'm sort of thinking, well, why not write about Joyce? I mean, he's Irish, right? <laughs> but no, it has to be Thomas Mann, probably because of the homosexual stuff. I don't know. Um, it gives me pause, and it and it adds to my not really enjoying his novel about Thomas Mann all that much. And so it was, and so of course, it, it, you know, I crawled into the Mann rabbit hole, which is a great, you know, very interesting rabbit hole to crawl into. The family was really interesting. I picked up or was really looking at this straight up bio of Thomas Mann by a Germanist, German professor, Klaus Schurter. Um, he was, um, he, he worked at Columbia. He was a professor for in the, in the 70s at the uh, University of Columbia in New York. And he's done a number of other of these straight up bios, but he's quite good. And he's, the big difference between a straight-up bio is that he's always contextualizing. He's putting Thomas Mann, you know, he talks about his relationship to 
to Goethe, the, the great German writer Goethe, and to uh, Nietzsche, and, and, and all of this sort of intellectual stuff, which you kind of have to do with Thomas Mann. I mean, that's kind of what made him tick. It's, he's, very, he's a very intellectual writer. And so for all of that to be lacking, and in the DTU Max article, the New Yorker one, apparently there were, uh, Tobin had tried to bring in a little bit, for example, of his discussions with Adorno when they're in, in California in exile, but he was forced to cut that. And it's just as if, it's as if you're cutting off the most important connection. To me, what makes a writer great or, or interesting, at least, is his connection to the or their connection, her connection to the intellectual milieu that they're in. And he, I don't get any sense of that. He sits in cafes, but we don't get a sense of that. And and in, in here, you do get a sense of that more, I think. And here's a sort of a quote from 18-year-old Thomas Mann about him. And I'll try and do, it's a kind of a difficult quote, but he, uh, Schwerter writes here, the 18 year old was already as astonishingly intellectually uh, mature. He seen, he understood the position of, of the admirer or admiring, uh, and um, yeah, admiring, bewundern, uh, as something, he understood this position correctly as a an addiction or leaning into something strange as an act of understanding um, from a position of distance and in such as a as a significant peculiarity of the artists themselves who um, transcends the limitations of his imaginations or imaginings by way of admiring and loving. So to transcend by way of admiring. The romantic concept of a Sehnsucht, desire, longing, uh, that we see, for example, in Tonio Kruger and some of the other novels, even Dr. Faustus. So this, the, the, the spiel, the play of distance and uh, uh, intimacy, we see that a lot. And, 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 and that, that is why I'm kind of inclined to go with the people who are hesitant to assign man as an active homosexual. I kind of, in this, and I do remember in Dr. Faustus, there's this, uh, that the main character identified with the Little Mermaid. So the character from Hans Christian Andersen, who, you know, is famously sort of friend zoned by the prince, who loves the prince, but it's not, it's not reciprocal. So this sort of, the stance of, of loving and not being loved back that Anderson was really kind of about too. Also another uh, rep more repressed homosexual, bisexual, but who kind of would deliberately engage in these relationships that were not reciprocated. And I see a kind of connection there to man, uh, not so much in the suffering side, but more in the understanding that that's what is um, that's that's kind of what he wants. He doesn't want the actual thing. He wants the stance of the desirer. I don't know if that makes any sense. And I I, I actually think he was pretty happy with Katya. I mean, she's a great. Uh, she was a great partner to him, and I think she obviously knew what was going on. She knows. And I, I I think she was. She knew what she was getting into or got, had gotten into. She was very very sort of practical and a good mother and supremely uh, smart woman. And they re it was a partnership, it was a good partnership. And I mean, in a way that's kind of, the book does give her some credit, the Toyobin book now. But anyway, it's as if the, for me, what's interesting about Thomas Mann is the intellectual milieu and the, the, his, the writing and the development of the texts, which you much get much more in here, like, you know, um, a straight up bio. And so, you know, and then the other thing is that all the wonderful works of him, you know, all the, uh, his stories. Uh, and then, then also, well, Heinrich Mann is interesting. I've never read any Heinrich Mann. I, I'm pretty sure he's not a good, as good a writer as Thomas, <laughs> but he's an interesting, his brother, his older brother, but who's really actually interesting. And for people who are kind of not really wanting to read Thomas Mann, cause you know, heady stuff, you know, long novels, pick up, Kaussmann. Now, I had a, a, a as a young uh, sort of someone who was just kind of getting comfortable in the German language. I had a pretty 
um, strong phase where I really liked Thomas, uh, Klaus Mann much more than Thomas. I wasn't interested in Thomas Mann. He was too stodgy for me as a teenager, but who was not stodgy because he was much more an the anti-fascist, the socialist, politically engaged, was Klaus Mann, openly gay uh, or bi. Him and Erika. Now, Erika's interesting. She didn't write novels um, as much, I don't think, but they, did, they wrote a kind of a biography together, autobiography about the, their lives. Anyway, he wrote this famous novel that I was really into when I was growing up called Mephisto, which is about this friend that actually Erika married, an actor, Gustav Gründgens, I'll insert a picture here, very good actor who kind of sold his soul to the actual devil, namely the Nazis. And it was actually turned into a really good movie with um, Klaus Maria Brandauer, who, who the only thing is he doesn't really look like good, good Gründgens, really different type. But it was called Mephisto, and this book was um, banned. The book was always very controversial, and it was forbidden in West Germany until 1968, because it was about a real person. I mean, there was, this really is about, um, he has a different name and everything, but it's it, his name is like, his name is Höfgen, Heinrich Höfgen. And I remember really enjoying this novel. It's really quite, quite good. And another novel I really enjoyed, what do you know, another art, uh, 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 sort of fictionalized autobiography is this one about Tchaikovsky. It's really good, Sympathie, Symphonie Pathétique. I really enjoyed these in my, a long time ago and I would like to reread them. So if you're not into Thomas Mann, read these. I would suggest before you read this, although I know, I know, I know a lot of you did like it and I apologize for having to say no, no, nine. I cannot do it. <laughs> so that's that. Um, 16 minutes on the months. I'm, I, and I had, before I went to Germany, I had actually wanted to start another man that I hadn't read yet. Um, this is the chosen one, which is, I think, this is a strange one because it's the one that's the medieval one. It's a later one. Yeah, it's, Tom it's a later Thomas Mann. And I do, I think I prefer the later Thomas Mann to the early Thomas Mann. I mean, Wooden Books is fine, but um, but I, I'm a little bit Thomas Mann out. <laughs> he's, he's sort of occupied too much of my brain space. So I'm kind of taking a break from him. Anyway, so what else am I reading? I'm almost finished with the Bowen, which is still really, really good. I love the style, but, but because it is about a bunch of British people being extremely British, not to say unclear about what's going on, but I, I kind of have it. Um, and it's it's the kind of book that I can't force myself to read quickly. It's such it's such a beautifully written book, uh, but but I like it in little little snippets almost, even though it's short. So I'm still not quite done. I hope to be done by next Tuesday. It's brilliant. It is brilliant though. I mean, this is a she's a really really good writer, and you know she's my kind of writer. And I hate to say it, but I think. In general, I mean, I'm still on the lookout for good genre fiction that I like. I mean, I didn't mind the murder butts and um, I want to try some, some other ones, but I have a hard time with, maybe I have a hard time with pseudo pretentious midbrow, <laughs> which is what I would characterize that as, as opposed to genre fiction, good genre fiction, or, you know, I don't know. It all depends. It, it depends on the writer. You can't really generalize. I shouldn't even be saying mid-brow and high-brow and all that stuff, although it's kind of an interest to me. Uh, speaking, uh, sorry to come back to Man for a little bit. So the class stuff is also really interesting with Man, who's, he, he is very bourgeois, but see, for him, the bourgeois life, it kind of almost reminds you of Zola, the guy is Zola. He wanted the front of the bourgeois, he, and, but it wasn't just the front. He did really like, he liked to be neat and and orderly and he was kind of really bourgeois but yet it did give him a kind of a screen behind which then he could be you know not bourgeois namely uh homosexual so his his relationship to class and see what's interesting about Katya is that so he can he came from a very sort of bourgeois upper upper middle class background but not very intellectual you know his father was a a merchant and so what Katja and Katja's family gave him was the sort of vibrant intellectual atmosphere, even though, I mean, her, it's funny because her father was a math professor and she was actually more of a STEM. She was studying or listening to science, uh, science lectures at the university. She didn't get a degree, but she was 
a young woman listening to Röntgen, the x-ray guy, and math, even though she, said, she says in this bio that I've been watching that she wasn't good at math, but but then the, the, the household itself and her brother, they were, they were very sort of listening to Wagner and having discussions about music, much more so than their moms really. So I think in a way, he kind of wanted her because of that milieu thing again with, with her was important to him. Uh, where was I? Talking about Bowen, so that's uh, not quite done yet. And I, I also haven't been, a haven't had the sort of quiet time in my brain to dis devote to, to Hoffman, who's also good, but I need to be in the right space. Um, yeah, and I, and I haven't really been there for that yet. And also, I mean, I'm looking at Ma Ma Miss Macintosh, which I won't show you, the big novel that I had to stop before Germany and everything, that I do want to continue with, even if it's going to take me years to finish it. it, it it's looking that way, that it will take me years. And, oh yes, and so, and I'm also listening to my genre book. See, that's a genre that I can take. I really think it's not bad. It's It's getting a little bit, Repetitive. This is the f the fourth or fifth book in the Amazon, the fantasy trilogy that I'm, oh, tra fantasy series that I'm listening to, by Steven Erickson. But he's a, a, for what he's doing, he's doing a really good job, you know, which is a fantasy. It's, uh, but the sort of other book that I've picked up just to sort of get my mind out of hoity-toity British Britain and and nineteenth century Germany. I wanted a different space, <laughs> a different place to travel. And so I picked France and uh and. Uh, uh, the countryside, the, the south of France, Jean Giono, whose name I came across reading Magna Zabo's The Door. And for some reason, I'm like, oh, I want to try this guy. So uh, really interesting writer, pacifist, apolitical, so much so that he was I imprisoned by, you know, anti-Nazi anti France, but not for very long ever. But also someone who writes a lot about nature. Who, 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 for whom nature plays a, a role in his writing. And it's kind of, I like that a lot. So I'm gonna read his book, um, or I started his book, A King Alone. And even the first few pages, I really do like it. I really like the style. Um, it, he writes about trees in an interesting way. And I think this is gonna be good. So Jean Genon, so mid, this was published in 1947, I think, in France. And one of his claims to claim to fame, yeah, 1947, one of his claim to fame is, for the American audience, is that he bought Moby Dick, the novel Moby Dick and Herman Melville, to French people. So kind of bringing something back. And I will read this and tell you more about it. So not that well known, but he's, in, he's, been, he's been reissued by, you know, it's one of our NYRB classics. I love the cover, the sort of gray, uh, foggy cover love that love that so that's my new read that i won't be done with by next week but i'll be in into it more so i'll be able to tell you more about it so yeah uh that's about it i apologize to have to have been have have just to have had to have said negative things about this book but it's just my own opinions you know and um yeah i hope everyone's doing well and I'll probably, you know, post a, a, a stationary thing, I'll, I'll unbox my stationary, very little brow of me, my stationary possession is very, <laughs> but I don't care. <laughs> um, and I will talk to you all next week. I, I have to say I am having slight vision issues today. I'm going to have to see if I can get new glasses. I need to go to the eye doctor. So sorry for, if I sort of look like I'm peering at you all. It's like I'm having a hard time seeing <laughs> clearly um probably just tiredness hope everyone's doing well thank you all for watching and commenting and i will see you at the latest next week bye bye